Hello? Hello? Okay, uh, we'll get started. Sorry, I'm a bit late. Um, so, let me make it slightly bigger. And uh, so, today we're going to talk about actually, before we're continuing and introducing more about the Vue.js, uh, we're going to talk about everything else you need to do uh, to prepare for the first, uh, first coursework. So, this is in, in, including about, say, and sketching what your app is going to look like and do the basic HTML and CSS things. Of course, we're gonna, not going to go back to cover what HTML and CSS are, but maybe a few things that can be useful uh, for your coursework. Uh, we already covered some of them in the second year, so some of these just like a quick review. For example, uh, anyone still remember CSS Grid? Yeah, which is quite useful. Not everyone looks like it. I, mean, I think this will be very useful when you try to lay out your uh, front end in the first coursework. So I'm going to do a quick review of that. Okay, <clears throat> let's get started. Uh, okay, and so first, I uh, just want to say a bit more about the first coursework and the details. And it's uh, in now the detailed marking scheme is available uh, on the module page. So there's already some information in the module handbook, uh, but there's more detailed ones uh, now on the module page. Uh, I'm going to have a look now. Um, before we look at the marking scheme, just very quickly, <coughs> since um, obviously you have to use Vue.js with some clarifications, you will be able to use other libraries, but not say replacing Vue.js. And we have to put your code on GitHub and have the number of commits, I think it was 10. And then you have to demonstrate, uh, which is after deadline in lab. So that's similar to what we did in the second year in terms of demonstration. Uh, <clears throat> uh, okay, so as I said, the details are now on the module page. Uh, I need to log in. Yeah. Uh, okay, I might have to do it again. Okay. So let's try again. Okay. Okay, and so if you go to the module page and you, okay, it's a bit small, but hopefully we'll be able to see. Go under assessment and feedback, so it might be collapsed like this before. You need to expand it. And there's a bit more details now in the coursework one, web app with views.js. So it was there all the time. <coughs> <coughs> but now it has this uh, PDF file, which gives you a bit more details about uh, what you need to do. So this is what will be what it look like. And so the first the deadline is 5 p.m. on Monday. Sorry, on 5 p.m. on Friday of week eight. So we are currently in week four, I think. So there's four more weeks to go. Uh, the task will be to create the front end of a picture, so made up web app will allow students and parents to look for after school classes, these like say math or English classes or activities, for example sports class. So that's the setup, quite straightforward. Uh, and then for this task, uh, the first coursework do the front end, and uh, the second coursework will view the back end for the app, and the last coursework will turn that into a mobile app. This is the general plan. So we're going to build on top of each of these ones and through the module. OK, uh, in, in terms of submissions, uh, you have to put all the files you needed to run your app in one zip file. So the maximum size is 10 megabytes. 
in a sense, you probably not be able to include in any videos. Okay, and it has to be it has to be zipped. Otherwise, the system will not allow you to submit the file and has to be less than 10. Again, otherwise it will stop you from submitting. So the things you need to submit, including the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript file, so including the view. And that's fairly standard. I need a text file containing the GitHub repository URL. So we said that the code has to be on GitHub as well. So you need to tell, tell me uh, what your GitHub repository URL is, and also, and if you make your GitHub uh, private, then you either have to make it public or give access to me. I can give you my GitHub account and you can add me to your project and I can see it. It's up to you. And if you don't want to give me a specifically change the settings, you can just make it public. Uh, maybe I can show you maybe just before the submission. Because I mean, you, got, I mean, you, can, you can keep it private for now until just before the submission and before make it public, if you want. Okay, and uh, also, <coughs> okay, also mm -hmm. any, any external library files, if you're using any. So people ask to say, can I use Bootstrap? The answer is yes. And then if you can load the Bootstrap files and from a CDN, which is online, and similar to we are doing for Vue, where we just has a script tag in the head section of the file which loads Vue.js from some online servers. And that's where it's fine. And if you don't do that, if you have a local installation, like a local copy of the Vue file, that needs to be included in your submission as well for any libraries um, for that purpose. Yeah, is that okay? Okay, uh, yes, I mentioned this already. You need to make the GitHub public uh, repository public. Um, that's, you can leave that to just before the submission, that will be fine. Okay, uh, this might be useful. <coughs> so, here yeah, we're not going to be using any database or storage uh, like MongoDB. So, everything you need to store in terms of using local storage. Okay, we covered that last year, so you should know how to use it. Uh, as mentioned already, you can use external libraries like Bootstrap, and then just make sure it will work, either it's including the library files or use its online server, which is... <clears throat> okay, and then you allow to use other JavaScript libraries uh, so long as it does not duplicate or replace the features provided by Vue.js. So everything Vue does, you have to use Vue, you're not allowed to use anything else. But if you do other things, you for example, add a carousel to your web page, and you can use some library, JavaScript libraries to do that. Okay. But that, that particular example is not going to give you any extra marks, really, when we look at the marking scheme later on. Okay. And if you're not clear or not sure, check with me. Just to show me, okay, I want to use this library, is it okay? <coughs> Um, okay, and then in terms of the marking scheme, so for this submission is 25%, because we said in total for the first coursework is 35, but 10% is in-lab tasks when you do the group. So for this submission itself, uh, it's 25%. Uh, we talked about these already. Okay, and then, okay, these are the extra requirements, which is not in the slides or the module handbook. So during the lab demonstration, you have to be able to explain the code, right? Not just show me the code is running particularly. If I ask you why you write this code and how that works, you must be able to explain. Otherwise, even if it's working, you're not going to get any marks for that part of the code if you can't explain. Yeah, that's the whole point of the demonstration. Okay, and you have to do use as much as Vue.js as possible. Usually, this actually saves your uh, effort and we have to write less, less line of code. So um, you're not allowed to use, say, the plain JavaScript or other libraries, and if you can do that in uh, Vue.js, again, so if you do it that way, you're not going to get a mark for those parts. Okay? So it just really try to force you to use Vue.js. <coughs> uh, now to the more detailed <coughs> marking scheme itself. Uh, the first part is about user. Uh, we need two types of users. 
And one is the people users looking for activities or classes, so these could be students or their parents. And then the second type of users, which are the ones who are providing these classes and activities. So these are two. <clears throat> so they have to be treated slightly differently. And the difference is, for example, when the people register, they have to pick, okay, whether I'm a provider or I'm a normal user looking for services. And then once you log in, for example, for the provider, they should have the option to uh, add information, say, list of the classes and services they have. Okay. Uh, and then for both type of users, uh, these things are fairly standard. Oh, we have you already done that already. It's this time we try to use view uh, to help them a little bit more. Uh, when you register, you need for each user it have at least email address and password. If you want other information like a uh, username, it's up to you. Um, use um, validation for these um, fields when you do them. Um, your app, and at least um, do some HTML email validation. So it's basically using the building checking, building form check in HTML to check whether it's an HTML or not. So that should be fairly simple. It's just an attribute and in your text field tag. Okay. <clears throat> the next part will be slightly more difficult. We're going to cover that in give some examples in the lecture later on. Is you have to check if the email address is already registered or not. Okay. The idea is quite straightforward. If the user types in an email, you just look at all the registered users. Is that email already used, registered? That's all. And if it's a yes, you say no, you can't register the same email. That's all. Okay. This is a bit extra than before. Uh, okay. And then the logging and the logout. And once you do the logging, um, there should be some information shown on your front. On your app, it shows, okay, this is the log which is already logged in. For example, you're showing the user name of the user or show a picture of the user, something like that. And when you check uh, the username and password when they log in, you need to provide any information either when the password is wrong or the email address is not registered. So essentially, you need to provide at least two types of error messages uh, for logging. So either password is wrong or the email is not registered. And finally, you say when you use it, so it should, should be a logout button when you click that, and you should remove any information about the user from the page. So that from the first one, you will show some information when the user logs in. I don't want to see that click the logout button. And that should be removed from the page. Yeah. So these should be all fairly straightforward. <clears throat> okay, uh, and then these are the main things people can do in the front end. Uh, the first, okay, so this is for the people looking for activities in the class. Uh, for the first thing is to do search, which you again already done that before, and this time again we will only search using whatever is stored in your local storage. We can, so you need to do search. Just on activity topics, um, but this will be say full time search, sorry, full text search. So the topic will be something like a math class or sports club. Okay, and you don't need to search on other fields as a price or something. Okay, so the next point is just really say the search has to be full text search. For example, if the user only search uh, a single letter T, and it should include return the result, uh, which are including mass class or sports club activities, because they both have T's in their description or all the title or the topic. Okay, let's just say it's a full text search. Okay, <clears throat> and this will be the slightly trickier part, is to say the search must also work on the results of filtering. So filtering is the another thing you can do. But what it says here is, user can filter results first, say I'm only interested in math class. And then after you do the filtering, you can do search within only the math class to search for specific things. I don't know, maybe interested in advanced math or something. Okay. So that means you have to search, not always from the original in the entire data set, but depends on <coughs> what currently is showing to the user. 
<coughs> okay, I know that actually leads to the next part where actually a user should be able to do filtering. Uh, so basically a user can say, pick, I'm only interested in certain type of class, or I'm interested in, only interested in certain type of price range. Each class will have a, each activity will have a price, or a review ranking. So that's something a bit new. So user will be able to leave reviews for activities or class, and then user will be able to filter by the review ranking. And the filter should be able to apply more than once. So for example, I can first review, so filter by topic, and then by review, for example. So I'm only interested in mass class with at least four star reviews. We should be able to do that kind of thing. And then maybe say filter by type again, Okay, so it's the same. So filter must also work on the result of the search as well. So for example, user can do a search and then a filter, yeah. Um, sorry, I have a question for this um, sort uh, by, I don't know, by price or review. So first we want to search by price and later we want to search, uh, I mean, sort by review, let's say, yeah? Only this, or you have like two filters at once? Like, you talk about sorting or the filter. Ah, it, it will be filter. Okay. Filter. Yeah, that's filtering. So we're talking about filtering now. Okay, I try to make it bigger. So, so we talk about filtering. So that means uh, you have these three options. You can filter. Okay, I was confused because I switched to sort. Okay. 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 Sorry, but it's okay. Because yeah, it's very good. Yeah, yeah. Filter. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, that's good. And then I yeah, was here, so and um, you should be able to filter based on. I'm not just inside the set, but also maybe the origin, the result of search result. When people do the search, and you have lots of results come back, and you can just filter on those. Okay. And uh, so the last one it says the options in the filter, for example, different price range or different topic of an activity, and it should only be there in the filter option if there is something uh, available in the result or on the the collections people can see. So if people do some filtering and on the topic of the, so if people search for say maths, so okay, if people say search for English and then all the activity with English in the class, in the topic would get returned and then none of them actually contain maths as a topic, <clears throat> then the maths itself should not become a options in the filter anymore because there's nothing to filter, yeah? So this is just makes things a little bit more realistic, what you would actually see on the website. Okay, and now we come to the sorting part. And uh, you should, again, be sorting by the option by the topic, the price, or the review ratings, okay? And uh, we only do sorting by one attribute only, so and you can say sort by topic, but later on if you change to sorting by price, essentially it overrides the first one, you forget about the topic. Okay. It's only sorting by price. Okay, <laughs> and you need to have the option to allow to change the sorting order, so you can have ascending or descending, so either from minimum, largest to smallest, or the other way. Again, so you have to consider when it has already been the search or filtering applied, then the sorting should only be performed on the results of the search or the filtering. Okay. So basically the search, filter, and uh, sort should have all worked together. Even when something happens, the other thing can be applied a little bit later. Any questions so far? So. <clears throat> Okay, uh, then then comes to the uh, review part. So the user can leave reviews for class of activities. Uh, there's no need to check, for example, whether the user actually buy or attend the activity class. Any user can leave review for any class of activities. And the only thing they need to uh, we're going to do here is just to leave a review ranking between one and five stars. Essentially, just need to record the number between one and five. It's up to you if you want to support 2.5 or anything, or just integers, up to you. 
And but what you need to do is a user can only review once for each uh, class activity. So in the sense, user has to be logged in first, and then you have to check if it leaves a review before. You can't leave multiple times for the same thing. And uh, then finally, uh, this information, uh, the active the review ranking, uh, needs to be displayed as part of the class or activity information. So should, for each class and activity, it should have the average rating, review rating, and number of reviews it has, which is I mean, very common. Uh, for example, like Amazon, that's how it works. So this part is a bit new. Any question? OK. OK, I think that's almost it. Uh, just uh, last bit um, about the service provider. So obviously, they should be able to do the search filtering as well. But in addition, they should be able to add updates or remove activities they list. So if you say they are service provider. So once they log in, they should see a list of the class or activities and they register or provide or add it to the system. So these are the minimal information for each um, class activity. You should have a topic. So this could be sports or sports club or mass. It has to have a price and location. You can say use local location like Hendon, Collingdale, or make up of some locations if you want. Uh, time and the length. So when the activity will be, for example, it's 4 p.m. every weekdays or every Mondays or something like that, and the length how long? It's one hour, two hours, etc. So these will be the minimal information for each activity. Okay, and then <coughs> so in terms of the service file, I see they need they should be able to either create a new one, new activity, or uh, class by entering all these information for each one, or they can change. For example, they want to change the price or the topic of description or the time of activity they already have. Yes? <coughs> yeah. Service provider should be able to remove those means. There must be admin area. The yeah. The parents can't handle it. Yes, yes. So, so that should be kind of just maybe just. A, Essentially, this one separate pages, which they can see, which a non-service provider cannot see, or they don't have that page, and they associated with an account which has this information on it. So only certain users can change it. No, only the user can only the user can see his or hers classes or activities. In a sense, only a provider can see the ones he or she registered. For example, I'm a provider. I'm providing math and English class. I should not be able to change or add class activities for other service providers. Only the ones I see. For example, I'm only providing math class, so I should only see one math class I provided when I logged in. You shouldn't see. If you want to see other people's providers, what do you go just do the normal search? They search for all the math class. You can see what is available. But you will not be able to change any details from it. Yeah? I mean, I think I understand the same. So you can have your as a student. Yeah. As a parent. Yeah. And as an admin, let's say. And then you have a little bit of ad, you know, access to the text from one page. Uh -huh. You can think about something like that. That's right. So basically, as I said at the beginning, you have two types of users. This will be the first one. Yeah, this will be the second type. Uh, so we call uh, we call this maybe normal users. Uh, their account the only thing is useful is when they leave the reviews. You need to check if it's the user and have they leave the before I review before. That's the only time you need to use their account information. And then the, the service provider they would have the extra option to add class or service. That's the only difference. They would be like they would be teachers. Um. Yeah, it could be teachers. I mean, could be a agency or company which provide these services. For example, Middlesex can list it there. I have so many courses I can uh, I can provide. Yeah, but I mean, think of like a, any e-commerce website. So these are people buying things, and these are the people who are selling things. 
So they will list the things they want to sell on the website, essentially. Like eBay, the users, if you want to sell something, have slightly different interface to add your things to the website. Yes? OK. So that's quite a lot to do, actually. Let me see, is there anything else in the marketing scheme? OK, no. Uh, that's pretty much everything in terms of the marketing scheme. So we go back to the lecture. <clears throat> oh, let me see how I'm doing in terms of time. Okay. Okay. Uh, so today we're going to actually uh, cover uh, these three things, which are actually before you get down to adding your Vue.js code to the website. Yeah. Any questions about the coursework? Okay. Anyway, so you can have a look at the description on the module page. Email me any questions. Actually, yeah, maybe I should mention that as well. Uh, so I do create this question and answer section on the module page, and if you click that, and it does has one for each coursework, and uh, you can actually add your questions there, or even just check there first, see if your question has already been asked, and. Uh, so what you need to do is to say you click edit and then you can just add your questions there. That's all you need to do if you want to change anything. And I will check that regularly to see any there's any questions that has not been answered. Um okay, uh so I'm gonna go through these ways steps which you needed for you when preparing for the first coursework and first let's sketch the website just roughly how your app front end is going to look like and then create HTML and CSS component as the code for it and these are the relatively straightforward and uh, fast part <clears throat> okay so we start with this one okay uh, when you try to design your app, and there's two options, and you can design it yourself, which is completely fine, and you can also have a look at existing e-commerce website and uh, use or borrow some of their design ideas. Not completely copy. <clears throat> so I'm sure you all know all of these sites: Amazon, eBay. Uh, but this will be be slightly less yeah. familiar. Yeah. Uh, that's mostly so that's like the biggest that's like an Amazon for China, but they also have international website. And Apple and Microsoft. Of course there's many more. And pick the one which is similar to what we need. We need to have options for buyers and sellers with these functions and allow people to and leave reviews. Which actually um, would apply to these two, and maybe for example, Apple and Microsoft do not necessarily have the uh, reviews those kind of functions. I can't remember, but it's really for you to. It's really for you to decide how you want to your website to look like. Okay, and then focus on the features that we need. If you're going to say have a look at the existing website and try to do similar designs. Focus on the features you will need. For example, um, recommendation is a big part in all these websites we try to recommend, but it's not something we're going to do in this coursework, probably way too much. And you're welcome to try, but, <coughs> uh, but these are the things we need. And search filter, uh, sorting, registering, logging, and especially for different types of users and reviews, and also how to add product and editing product details. For example, I'm pretty sure on eBay or Amazon you'll be able to add your own product and change details later. Okay, uh, I'm not saying say the design of these websites are the best. So personally, I don't really like the design of Amazon. I would say maybe Apple looks nicer. 
Amazon has all the features we have. It could be the place you start with and improve the design a bit later. So, okay, uh, that's the, also the other thing. Always get something very basic, but working first before you try to improve, say, the design or add more functions, add additional features. Right? With the most basic and most spare, but working things to start with. Okay, and so I can have a quick look, say, of Amazon websites. Again, this is probably not the best or most interesting design at all, but you do can see it has many, many lots of different uh, functions or sections on the web page, which you might not usually pay attention to. So even if you look at the top part, um, you have a menu button, you have the uh, Amazon logo, which is also a link, and you have the search, which allows you to tick different categories, and then you have the information about the user account, whether it's logged in or not, and then some other things, the basket, which we're actually not going to have a basket today, so that might be too much, and also try to find. And then you have a second menu bar, and a list of different type of things. Essentially, Amazon, kind of different Amazon service, it tried to sell to you. And then you have another one, which is starting to actually get different categories of the things that Amazon has. And then this is the bread crop. Essentially, it sings, okay, where is the kind of search doing in terms of the overall category? Again, you could or couldn't, uh, not necessary to have that. So this is the, the search, uh, sorting button. And this is the filter area. You have your filter or different options. And yeah, this is the actual search result area. Okay. So maybe most of the time you would pay attention to this part, maybe a little bit this one. We're actually using Amazon. And, but just have a look, for example, uh, the top part, and actually there's lots of things happening here. Some of you want to, some of you don't really want to. Or some of you can have a better design, that's what Amazon does. Okay, so when we try to create a sketch, um, you can use pen and paper, which is completely fine, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you can use software, uh, for example, called the Just In Mind. <coughs> Anyone heard of Just In Mind? Not using uh, at all. Oh, okay, uh, that's interesting. Uh, that's a link. So that's if you click, it should go to the Just In Mind website. So it's something like this, and I'm gonna use uh, demonstrate a little bit later on. So. Uh, I guess it has these common features of most of these uh, wireframe tools or sketch. So they can produce a very realistic design. So if you look at this part uh, without actually trying out, it's difficult to say is this a picture or is this an actual website. It's almost impossible to tell. So that allows you to provide it to create very high fidelity prototypes or wireframes. Uh, which is not what we're asking for, but it's possible to do. And also, when we're actually trying, I'll probably ask you to um, create something just to show the roughly look and the layout of the page, not something very high fidelity. And other common features, if you look at this one, and um, it can design for different type of screens. So this is obviously more like a desktop type of design, and this is more like a phone type of design. And uh, we're not gonna worry too much about now, but actually, now the general practice is we probably want to start with this first. If you want to design a new website, commercially, you design with for the phone first, and then you try to expand how that will look like on the big desktop. Partly because maybe more people are going to be look at your website from the phone now, and partly because um, it's much easier to expand, add more things to it, than going the other way around. Say, if you start this one, you want to shrink it to very small designs, it will be much harder because you have to take out a lot of things and make it still work. <coughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, there's one last feature I'm not gonna uh, say demonstrate today, but the other feature is you can actually say mock the user interaction, so not real ones, but mock ones. So, for example, 
let's say, user can click on this picture here, and it will load up another picture, which is the product page of this pair of shoes, say with price and other details. So it can almost make it work, look like working. But really, what it does is, is you click on a picture which loads another picture. So it's possible to do here. Okay. So, and part of the reason uh, I recommend this is because just mind is allow uh, it's free to trial. I think there's no limit of time. You can always trial. And uh, university, and um, at least last year, or when I was preparing the slides, I have license. But then when I checked today, the license expired. So I had to fix that part out. Okay. And uh, if you want to use other frame wireframe tools, that's completely fine. And nothing says you only have to do this. As I said, if you use on pen and paper, that's completely okay. If that's what you prefer. Okay, and it's quite intuitive to use. Um, so for me, I can almost look at the menus and figure out how to use it without having reading any document. And hopefully, while well, I show a demo a little bit later on, with maybe five or ten minutes, you should be able to know most of the uh, features. And it has relatively good documentation. With lots of, uh, as a commercial company, it has lots of documentation well prepared. <coughs> and then later on, we're going to look at mostly the screens and widgets as a template the master. Uh, I'll explain that when we go to the actual demo, where we'll try to design the look of our uh, front end. Okay. And just this, this is something new, which I, I just added uh, this morning, um, because um, I came across a potentially better alternative, uh, which is called the Figma. Anyone heard of Figma? Yeah, okay. So it does, so, I mean, partly because it's getting popularity very recently, but certainly quite nice as well. And in terms of functionality, and it's not that different from the just mine. For example, it can design very realistic mockups. You can do, say, if you click on one screen, it goes to the next one. And you can design for different screen sizes as well, etc., etc. And the nice thing about it is, as, yeah, for example, um, you can design quite uh, complex shapes, which is much harder to do in just in mind. And uh, and also other things nice about it is, and the first one, uh, this one is web based, so it just runs a browser. There's nothing to install, whereas uh, just in mind is quite big. It's like a 500 megabytes or something. You have to install for Mac. Uh, the benefit of being web based is allows you to do real time collaboration. So for example, you can open your design in Figma, and they can join other people to work on it together with you in the same time, in real time. So almost like a Google Doc, two people can edit it at the same time. And also, um, it's completely free we, for what we need in your case. So as I said, uh, just in mind is not free, so you actually have to pay. You do have a kind of limited version we can use. And, but for just in mind, everything is completely free. Okay. And so you can see, in terms of pricing, uh, in the free tier, you can have to have up to three projects. For our module, we just need one. Maybe you need one or two for another module. It's completely fine. And it saves history for 30 days, so that's just extra. Mm -hmm. I don't think most of you would need that. If you have two people editing at the same time, mostly you're going to just do this by yourself. And you can have unlimited storage, so you can have lots of things, save as many things as you want. Okay, uh, so I only discovered this recently, and I was hoping to, but I still have time to update the slides. So in this lecture, I'm gonna still using just in mind as demonstration, and uh, next year probably it will be updated using Figma. Okay, let's say this is a sketch we want to create, kind of inspired uh, by what Amazon looked like, if you remember. So we have kind of a logo, search bar, login information, 
maybe a shopping basket icon for them, so it's not necessary anymore. Uh, we have categories, maybe not. Uh, this will be the sorting button we can choose. Uh, this will be my filters, and this will be my search results. So my search results is slightly different, so I want to say display each product as a box and organize this way. I think that looks better than the above <coughs> ones. Okay, so let's say this is what we want to. Uh, uh, before we create, we can try to do this in <coughs> the. Come on. Uh, in, just in mind. Okay, so and um, this is and um, what it look like. So it will ask you, okay, do you want to create a new file or open the existing one? So I choose to create a new prototype. So prototype is what they call a wireframe design. And you get to choose what kind of device you want to uh, design for, which is set the size of the design canvas. And so I can pick web, but you could pick um, probably you'll start with web, but they also you can choose different phones as well. And it has on the right hand side is iPhone X, and you can do iPad as well. And it really depends on this. So they have the size of the common device. Okay, and then uh, I guess this is quite important is to set the size of the canvas. And in my case, I want to set to say full HD, which is about this much. So it's doing some work. Okay, so that's more or less the interface. Uh, so uh, I guess this is quite common for many of these design tools. And you have the menu bar on top, which are the buttons you can click. It's slightly difficult to see. Let me see if they have a white menu and seam. No. Interface, show rulers. Okay. So sorry, it doesn't really have a like a white menu background, so it'll be slightly harder to read. But and the top one will be the menu bar and the quick like, toolbar buttons you can click. And this side, and uh, probably the only way to make it larger the text. Ah, oh, sorry, so, no, can't, can't do. I guess there's another thing, so for example, if you run Figmice in the browser, you can easily increase font size, so you can see. Uh, but on this side, uh, we have the list they call the screens. Screen is like each wireframe itself is a screen. So maybe you have the login, that would be one screen, the search interface, another screen, uh, maybe what else do you need? Maybe the say adding product is not a screen, so you might have a few screens. And then on this side is widgets. The widgets are the things, for example, like the text field, the search bar, text pictures, these kind of things, <clears throat> which you can without you don't have to draw yourself. You can just add them from there. And this part is, is the properties that you would have. For example, you select some text and you can change the colors and font size, etc., etc. So let's say if we want to um, design something like this, um, I might start, say, adding my, if I start from um, top left, and then goes down, and top left goes all the way down. And so I might want to add a widget, it's called a logo, which doesn't have one. Uh, yeah, maybe just call image. So I can put it here. Okay, first I probably want to say zoom, it is to fit width. Okay, so that gives you a rough idea of what that looks like. 
Okay, so let's say that's my logo. And next one, I need a search bar. Uh, so it's a bit hard to see, but there's a search button here. So you can look in all widgets by rather than go through the list yourself, which is quite good. And you can just search here. Search. Mm, no. Okay, it has a search field. So I can put it here. Ah. <coughs> okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Uh, as you see, so as you select this search bar, essentially it's just a box uh, with a little picture, and that's all it is. And you can do it yourself quite easily as well, and you can use that existing one. And but then you can see on this side, and you're starting getting these normal things you can do in terms of formatting this little box. And you can set the positions, and you can set the size. There's other things you can uh, formatting as well. Uh, ah, not much. Uh, for example, you should be able to change the borders and colors or things as well. Uh, it's not here. And on this part, uh, which we're not going to talk too much, and um, is using this concept and um, called the layers. So each of these things, new things, can be called a new layer. So we have our first screen, which is our, say, the search interface. And these are the things which is on there. We currently have a search input and an uh, image. The image will be uh, this thing here. Actually, if I do this picture, and position, ah. Oh, it is a SVG, so can I make it bigger? Hmm. Hmm. Okay, I uh, couldn't quite change. Uh, I'm not sure even you can see at all, so that's a little picture of a Megaline classic which comes with the search bar. Obviously, when I increase the box, the search bar becomes too small. Um, I was hoping to change the size, but certainly I didn't find any options on the left-hand side, which allows me to do this. But it definitely should be able to. Uh, it's an SVG, so you can replace this with other pictures. Hmm. Oops. And um, okay, uh, I guess you get the general ideas. So you just say, if you have something like this in mind, you just need to add these things onto your design using any wireframe tools. And all you really, really need is just boxes, really just boxes and text fields. That's all it is. So this is uh, filter area is a box, and you have to color the box inside and some text. That's all you really need. Okay, so that's the introduction part for the just in mind. And uh, encourage you to try out either this or maybe Figma. And uh, maybe I can show you very quickly what Figma looks like. I think it's Google. Yeah. Uh, so, and this is like one of the things I tried in Figma, and you can see the interface is quite similar. You got all these icons on top. Here, it's more compact because you have all these icons. You can click the arrows to the right. You have a bit more information for the speech options. Uh, and then on the left hand side is the different screens. You have this one here which is the one I'm looking at, 
on the right hand side is the things you can format. And uh, for example, this is the line I created, which is not very pretty, but it just shows you can actually create fairly complex lines in Figma, which will be much harder to do in many other tools. Okay. Uh, so once you have your HTML element, and the next time, oh, sorry, the the wireframe next one, once you create your HTML component, okay. And then when you do this, and don't worry about the layout, just do this as quickly as possible. Okay. So for example, and this will be a very simple one. So in the body, I have my header, which will include my, say, search bars, uh, logos, and some buttons for logo logout, for example. And I have my sidebar, which is put aside, and I have three filters inside. Okay. And finally is my main section. And for now, okay, I put in six uh, products each as a div. Okay. That's all I want to do. And so, when you it's first created, you write this code, it's going to look like this. Okay, Not pretty at all, not layout as what you wanted at all, which is completely fine, so don't worry about it. Okay, I'm not going to explain, say, what these different elements are and why you should use them. I just want to quickly remind you, and if you something, use something called Emmet, it's going to make the life much easier when you're creating these things. Okay, so first, and does anyone still remember Emmet, which was mentioned in the lab quickly last week? So it's a shorthand way to write HTML and CSS code, not just say shorten each tag. It allows you to produce uh, lots of tags within one line. And the other thing is that it supports in Visual Studio Code. There's nothing to install. If you run Visual Studio Code, it's already there. And you probably started using them already. Okay. And uh, the easiest thing, and also it's very easy to learn, the, the syntax is a, quite straightforward. Uh, okay, this is black again. Okay, at least I can make this one bigger. Are you okay to see now with your if you have a good eyesight? Mm. Okay, so the syntax is very simple. For example, an arrow uh, means a chosen element. So the example given here is nav ul ri. So this is quite useful, quite common in your head section. You might want to have a navigation section element, which contains an unordered list, which has a number of lists inside. Okay, what it produces give you is a nav list. So an unordered list. And the error at one error at it. and you can have more than one as well. Yeah, so that's how it is. So I'm gonna just demonstrate it very quickly. Say <coughs> um okay, let me do Visual Studio Code. I can close this one now. So I don't want to say this. And I create a new file, uh, I save it as, uh, let's save it anywhere, uh, maybe save under code. Okay, so what I did first is I saved this as index.html, so it knows it's an HTML file, then it will try to interpret with what you're typing as Emmet. And so, so you've probably already seen this used a lot. So if I use just an exclamation mark, and it would say, okay, I don't recognize this is the Emmet aberration, so that means it recognizes the Emmet command. And then you press tab, and it will give you the normal HTML5 head section, so doc type, language, and all other things there. And then we go down a little bit here. Say in our case, what we want to create is this code. So that's the body part. And so I want a head section, header section, sorry, because that's different from header. So image, div, and three buttons. Okay. 
So we can create uh, all these in one line of code. So what you do is you type in header, okay, and then I have this one. That means and inside header, I want to, I can't remember now, uh, maybe an image and then a div and then button. Okay, the plus means uh, the same level. So one image, one div and button. In this case, I want uh, three buttons. So I times three. Yeah, and you can see Okay, you still understand. That means okay, you're still using the right thing. And you press Tab key. Okay, that's what it produced. And you had the header image. It has default source. You know, you can type in later, and you can have the buttons, buttons there. So okay, okay, from one line, so much faster. Also, make the, the less likely you're gonna make errors. Okay, uh, the next one is okay. I want a side. With three div inside, and each one has like a hex called filter. Let's say this is all I want. So, what I'm gonna do is I will do I want a side inside I have three divs, and uh, each div I want to have a text called filter. Okay, so this is a side inside I want three divs. The text inside each div is called filter. Is that enter also work? Yeah, okay, so it also works. Then you have a side, then in the three divs, each div it has a filter. And finally, okay, so that part is the same. So, a uh, product with five, so you have the main section with six div in it, and each text is called div. So, okay, anyone? can now create, what is the MF for creating this part? The main with six div inside and each has product. Maybe. Yeah, so obviously you need main and you don't need to type the angle bracket. And uh, inside we use angle bracket, this is an arrow or angle bracket. We want, is that six div inside? Yeah, six div inside and all of them called product. So you just type div and I want six times six. And the actual text you have to put inside the curly bra. Uh, and give you a product. And that you have it. That's that's it. So really and uh, so this is what this um, cheat sheet is doing. So it tells you, okay, how do you, if you want to do something inside, which is this, if you want to do something at the same level, this, and um, you have more complex ones, okay, and if you want to do something repeat multiple times, just use uh, the star sign for the by number. This is fairly simple rules, a few things, all you need uh, just to get started. So that'll be useful to use when you're actually creating a website. Uh, okay, I'm wrong behind. So this is gonna what the uh, page gonna look like. Uh, except uh, okay, our, what are we created is very similar, except we don't have these labels or text for the uh, this div and these three buttons here. It, it already is. But this is a good start. It has uh, obviously it doesn't look any way like this yet. But it has all the things we need there already there in terms of HTML, or most of them. Okay, and the next part will be add some uh, CSS to make it look nice. Uh, okay, so this is probably involve adding some classes and IDs first, so you can format them. And unless you want to format the element. Uh, all of them apply the same formatting. So, for example, definitely uh, for these filters, we probably want to give them a class. So, all these filters for the same formatting, 
and all the product has its own class, so they all look the same. Whereas this will be different from other fields. Say, for example, this is your search box, so you talk about this specific different formatting, which only applies to search box. Okay, and then you need to write your uh, CSS rules. I was hoping to type to this like a as a live demo, but obviously I don't have time to do that now. So I just and um, again nothing of these are new. You already all have seen that before from last year. And um, maybe the only thing I want to mention is for this part for for this for now, and I make the div, the header, the side, and the main, the four main components have border, so I can see the size and position of these things. Uh, so these are, yeah, some of these actually might be interesting to discuss. Okay, maybe I only pick this one last thing I want to discuss. Uh, it's called the uh, inline block. Anyone knows what inline block does? This very last line, it says uh, display inline block. Okay, so um, this is related to the effects I want to achieve. For example, and each of these is a div, and by default, each of them will start a new line. So you will not go like this. It will say product one, empty space. This one actually will display here, and third one here all the way down, which is what we want. We want it to go all the way through after the design before it comes back to the second row. Okay. So that's you want to change the display to inline, but also because you have blocks, so it makes them inline blocks. So it actually, if it's wider, it will even fill out more space on the top of it. Uh, okay, so uh, this is what we produced so far, which is looks quite close to what we wanted. If we go back again just to see, uh, yeah, so this is what we initially had in mind. Of course, not exactly the same yet, but most of the things are there, and so are the positions. Okay, and the only other thing, okay, maybe to some people it doesn't really matter, uh, but it bothers me, bothers me quite a bit, is these books are not perfectly aligned. So this is actually the HTML page. So for example, this side and uh, the books, the top page is more or less the same as this side, but just slightly lower. Okay, and again, for example, on this side, uh, these two end edges this is slightly wider than this, okay? All these small, tiny little things. And you might, some people might be okay, but for me, it quite bothers me a lot. And if you want to set the width and height just to make them perfect alive, it will be very time consuming, okay? And uh, there's lots of details inside because when you set the size, and uh, these browser itself, it introduced default, for example, and uh, paddings or space around the boxes. And which you cannot control. Okay, so that's why I just want to say very quickly using the uh, CSS script with the time we have. So that's again mentioned the last year as well. So I'm going to just do that very quickly. So it allows you to do quite complex 2D layout very quickly. So for example, you can have a layout of different boxes like this for a website, which is very easy. Forward. And it will make sure it actually aligns perfectly. Uh, so, okay, uh, the important concept, and you need to know the columns, uh, which are these ones, and the rows, which are these. And then there's another concept called the gutter. Essentially, that basically means uh, the space between the columns. or yeah, between the columns. So that is scatter. Well, that's all three things, only three things you need to know. Okay, and if we look at this, our uh, sketch or the, the front end so far, really I only just need a 2x2 two two grid. 
So I need two rows. Uh, top row, actually, uh, top row for the header section, the bottom row for the filters and the main product. And probably two columns as well, because for the second row, I need to break the filter from the product section. That's all we need. And then, okay. And so, the, again, it's quite easy to do. So first, and uh, you need to say, okay, I can apply my grid, so CSS grid, to something. And in this, we'll have a class called the container, which is div include everything. I just say display grid. That's all I need to do. So then it will be able to uh, try to, the browser will try to use CSS grid to lay out your everything inside the container. Okay, and then this is one of the ways to define the columns, okay, which is a recommended way. And what it does is it tells you the relative size between the columns without specifying the absolute size, which is really useful because you don't really know what the size the display you're going to have, people can look at all. So for example, when you set the width of an element on your page, you probably won't set that percentages rather than fixed pixels because it then adjust by itself. Similar concept. And so what this one says is each FR is a, like a special unit fragment. It says I want uh, three columns and the width of each column is one. So basically I have three columns of exactly the same size, the same width, that's all I say. And does this work? Uh, okay, yeah, but probably don't have time to cover. So there's a link uh, which will show you some examples. But in our particular case, uh, I only need two, two columns, if you remember uh, from the previous one, uh, with this two by two. We only really just need two uh, columns. This is one of them, and this is the other one of them. I need this one to be much wider than this one, which is my sidebar. So what I did is I say this, okay, the grid template column, so that's just like attributes, like font size or something. I need two columns. The first one is 1FR, the second one is 3FR. That means the second one is three times as wide as the first one. So I have one narrower and one wider columns, the second one being three times wider. Okay. Okay, and then if you remember, we had this um, gutter concept, which is a space between the columns. And now I set a particularly gap size, which is 20 pixels. And then you can adjust it depends on how much you want. And it really depends on, say, how much space do you want between the sidebar and your product display area. Again, if you click the link here, it goes to show you uh, in the code pen what it looks like. Maybe I can just do it quickly. Uh, why everyone now changed to dark display? Um, okay, I just can only do. Um, so you can see uh, on this side, uh, I have a div, and the inside has six more divs. And the first, the outer parent div has a, a class called the container, and then it will have a display grid. That means I can use grid display afterwards. And then you have grid template. Is 2FR, 1FR, 1FR. So the first row is twice, as well as, as the second and third row, and I change the grid uh, gap to 20 pixels. So that means the space between all these are 20 pixels, and I can change. And for example, I can do 1FR, 1FR, uh, and you can see, okay, all now three is the same. Or I can do 1, 3, 1, for example. Okay, the middle one is bigger. I can change the gap to 10 pixels, so it's like smaller, or much wider, say 100, and have very wide ones. Okay, so very straightforward. Okay, uh, this is probably the last part. And then once you have the grid laid out, the last part is to put your different sections or components onto the grid. 
and we specify using grid column and grid row. So the best thing is probably look at something like this. Uh, so this says for my header, I want it from column one to column three. So if you remember, we had two columns. So you from the one, what means refers to the first column, and three means to the end of the second column. It always like this. And it says I will be grid row one. That means I want to the first row, which is top row. Okay, and then for the aside, uh, I want to in the first column, so this grid column one, and grid row two, so the second row now. So essentially, it will take uh, this part of the display, and the header goes all the way top. It takes from position one to three. That's what it means. And for the article, which was the main display product R, and the grid column will be the column will be two, second column, second row. That's all it's doing. That's all you need to do. Obviously, you can have more complex layouts. So that's what it looked like. Uh, so okay, this is not the page, the picture, but you can see okay, this one is the top one, this one takes the side one, and this one takes basically second row, second column. And you can see all these things now are perfectly aligned because they are following your grid. And this is not very difficult to do at all. I mean, just a few lines, really. You just need to understand what they are. Okay, and then this last one before we finish, uh, I want to mention one last thing. It's about web fonts. Again, that was covered. So, for example, you can see here I'm using some funny fonts here. And uh, probably does not come with any of the say, Windows or Mac systems. And uh, you might want to add a little bit extra for your website just using different fonts, um, which is very easy to do. And we recommend using. Google Fonts, so that's the URL there, and this is what it looks like. And you can use any of these fonts that's available on the on there. And uh, all you need to do is do this, okay? So before you can use a font, you have to kind of import it, almost like a library file. For example, you want to use Vue.js, you have to load the Vue.js library file first. The same here. So if you want to use a new font, you have imported either in HTML or CSS. And so this is the uh, yeah. So this is in HTML, and you need to. So this is in CSS. It's, you need to add this line of code at the, at the beginning of your CSS file. You say it's and import, at import URL, this URL will be given by the Google Fonts website, and that's all. And then later on, when you format your page, you can, for any part of the change the fonts, you can say font family with this Gloria, hallelujah. That's a particular name of this font you just imported. So I'll show you quickly, and let's say we go here. Let's say I want to use this font. Uh, Okay, oh, this is a Chinese one, so maybe not the best one. But you can still use it. Uh, hey, where is the link? Okay, and you, if you click select this font, and you would have the bottom, it says one font selected. And so that's all you need to do. Actually, it gives you all the code there as well. And so it tells you, if you just copy and paste, this line of code to your HTML, or you copy uh, this line of code for your CSS file, then you will be able to use this font. Uh, but you just have to say the font name is Vue Java Top. Okay, that's all you can do. And then there's lots of different options you can pick. Uh, from the, I think there's over 900 different fonts, and you can use. Okay, uh, that's all. That's all I want to cover today. So, 
Basically, we covered everything which is not involving JavaScript that you might need for the coursework, not just the first one, maybe for the second part as well. And from next week on, we will actually uh, go back to Vue.js and cover more details. Okay, that's all. Yes, yes. Uh, we can go there now. Yeah, but I, I think I said uh, three, three o'clock. Yeah, but you can also come in late. Um, it should say, do you know H06 in the calendar? Does it not say? Let me check. Uh, yeah, it says an H06. So that's the Hatchcraft uh, ground level goes to the end. HG06. Yeah. HG06. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah.